Pedram Hassanzade, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering and uh, Earth Science at Rice University. Uh, he'll be talking about using deep learning to accelerate uh, computational fluid dynamics. So another area that hasn't really come up a lot, but I know the industry actually uses uh, increasingly yes. and is starting to find its way into the HPC centers. So you'll see now wh why that is true. Um, he's a professor at, at Rice University doing uh, all things computational fluid dynamics and looking at a range of problems. And I'll let uh, Pedram uh, take it away. Okay. Pedram, all yours. Great. Uh, where is the... I think it's on, right? Yeah. Where's the pointer? Um. Oh, okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so my name is Pedram Hassanzadeh. I'm an assistant professor at Rice. Uh, my background and uh, my training is in uh, fluid dynamics and computational fluid dynamics. And in, pa in the past 10 years, I've been developing and using uh, computational models uh, for geophysical and environmental flows, uh, mostly focusing on uh, simulating turbulent flows. Now, more recently, in the past few years, uh, we have been exploring how deep learning, uh, the recent advances in uh, deep learning can be used to help us with better modeling turbulent flows. Now, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is going to, I'll keep talking about turbulent flows, but a lot of the ideas that uh, I'll discuss and some of these methods that we have developed can be used for all sorts of other problems that have similar challenges. Basically, when you have systems, that you have high dimensional dynamical systems uh, that are multi scale or multi physics and are just expensive to simulate. So, as you know, in the past uh, 70, 70 years, there have been a lot of advances in fluid mechanics and in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, we, for, for most of the problems, we have a good understanding of the governing equations for our thermofluid systems. There have been a lot of advances in numerical analysis. And so we have systematic rigorous methods now to understand the accuracy and the stability of a numerical method. We can calculate what's the order of the method and for what parameter regimes the method would be numerically stable. Also, as you know, there have been a lot of advances in software and hardware in high performance computing, which allow us to basically solve these equations on uh, massively parallel systems. So to give you an example, if I want to do a simulation, I still haven't figured out how this works, uh, of natural convection. Uh, if I want to simulate the fluid between two walls, when the wall in the bottom is at higher temperature compared to the one at the top, uh, and at some point, if you look at this system, this system becomes very turbulent. It's called natural convection. It's a prototype for a lot of different types of buoyancy-driven flows, whether you are in oil and gas industry, whether you want to simulate the air circulation in this room for, for HVAC problems, or whether you are looking at the ocean or the atmosphere. This is a prototype for a lot of those kind of problems. Now, for something like this, we know the equations, some form of the Navier-Stokes equations, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And we have a lot of methods, finite element, finite difference, finite volume, spectral methods that we can use to solve these equations. So we can start simulating a system like this uh, and simulating the turbulent flow. And we can try to push this to more and more complicated flow regimes by using more CPUs and, uh, and do better simulations. Now, Conventional CFD, which is basically what I described, it has some limitations, and it can be too slow for some applications. Now, what exactly slow means, it depends on the application, and we can talk about that, but there are some of, the, some of these problems that I can mention. One is that just accurate modeling of turbulent flows can become very difficult. That's because we will need very high resolution simulations of sometimes a multi-physics system. So there are various processes. We might know the equations, but we will need to solve these equations on very high resolutions. And also there are many of these different equations that we solved in a coupled fashion. There are problems involving online control and optimization, problems that are like for digital twins that you might, the, the simulation might not be very expensive, but you might need a very fast simulation because you want to do something online. And so if you have a system that takes a lot of time to solve on supercomputers, that would be too slow for you. 
Also, for a lot of problems involving design, we need to do a lot of simulations, and uh, that at some point is going to be too expensive for us. And so these solvers are too slow. And also another problem, I haven't worked much on inverse problems, but again, for inverse problems with a lot of methods, you need to do a lot of simulations. So again, if you are dealing with these kind of problems, and if you're dealing with a turbulent flow, there is a very good chance that you can't afford using conventional CFD to really do a high fidelity simulation of your turbulent flow. Now, of course, approaches have been uh, developed to deal with these kind of problems. Reduce order modeling is one approach that in the past 20, 30 years, there have been a lot of efforts to develop high accuracy, reduce order models. And I'm not going to talk about this. What I'm going to talk about is the ideas that have been used to accelerate the conventional CFD models by basically simplifying the equations to some extent. Going back to this problem, just using rayleigh bernard as an example, a lot of thermofluid systems, the challenge is that they are multi-scale and they are multi-physics. For example, if you look at this rayleigh bernard convection, we'll see that we have these large vertices, we have a smaller vertices, there is a lot of mixing at a smaller scale. So if you really want to do an accurate simulation of this system, you have to resolve the smallest scale and also you have to resolve uh, the largest scales. And we know that we can't just ignore the influence of the smaller scales. This is a very well-known problem in turbulence. Uh, we know that if you look at the energy of a turbulent flow versus wave number, basically the length of scale, so here the x-axis is the wavelength, wavelength uh, is the wave number, so one over length. We know that there's a lot of energy in the smaller scales, in these large vertices. But also through interactions of smaller and smaller vertices, there is energy in the very smallest scale. So again, thinking about this room, if you really want to simulate this system, you have to basically simulate vertices, the eddies that are a scale of tens of meters to millimeters at even smaller scales. And that's what, that's what makes dealing with turbulent flows very computationally expensive. So in the world of fluid mechanics and computational fluid mechanics, of course, in the past 50, 60 years, there have been a lot of methods developed to deal with this problem. And so there is a hierarchy of models that has been, have been used to basically simulate a turbulent flow. Now, in this hierarchy, the models at the top, they are computationally very expensive. In most problems, they're computationally prohibitive to use. But also, the physics is better resolved, and you don't need to do any approximation. So at the top of the hierarchy is DNS, which is direct numerical simulation. So basically, this means that if this is the energy spectrum of your system, we are going to resolve everything from the largest scales up to the smallest scale that I need to resolve. Again, if I'm simulating this room from the scales of tens of meters to millimeter, I'm going to resolve all of them. The next best thing we have is called LES, the large eddy simulation, which basically the idea is, well, I look at this, I can computationally afford to simulate these scales, and I'm going to find a simple method, simple representation of the smallest scales based on the larger scales. So just using a simple equation, the idea of LES and all the other methods that are simpler than that, generally called like the Reynolds averaging or RANDs, the idea is that you have these larger scales that I'm going to collectively show them with x. These are the scales here. And then we have these smaller scales that I'm going to collectively call them y. And I'm going to find a function that connects these two. So this has been sort of the state of the art of what's called subgrid scale modeling in turbulence, where we use some sort of physics-based or semi-empirical representation of the smaller scales based on the larger scales. So your CFD model is going to basically solve for this, and you are somehow going to account for the effect of this. So again, this is basically what I mentioned. So for, for years, maybe until a couple of years ago, we have been trying to find the best P. Whether I'm trying to find, to do heat transfer, or a problem that involves just the transport of momentum, the challenge has been, finding the best function P. Now in the past, past few years, there has been a lot of effort and increasing interest in the turbulence community, but also in the weather and climate modeling community 
because the challenge is pretty much the same. If you want to have a better simulation of a hurricane, a better prediction of a hurricane, you have to deal with this kind of problem. So there's been a lot of interest in finding a data-driven representation of this function P. So what people have done is basically you try to train a neural network that for the larger scales, if I, show, if I give the neural network the larger scale, it's going to tell me what the smallest scales are going to be. So this is a field that is really growing fast, and there are a lot of promises there, but also there are a lot of challenges. So what I'm going to tell you to uh, talk to you about today is to tell you a little bit about what my group has, be, has been working on in this field. So thinking about how the recent advances in AI, like pretty much by AI, I mean any method that would give us a data-driven representation for the scales that I can't resolve uh, numerically, is that there are a lot of questions to answer. One is, what's the best way to use AI? Now, again, because of tradition, because this is until a few years ago, this is how we dealt with subgrid scale processes, people have been basically trying to mimic the same thing, but using a neural network instead of P. But is this the only way that we can use machine learning to deal with subgrid scale models? Even once you know that answer, the question is, what is the machine learning method or deep learning method to use? There are all sorts of methods out there. Uh, most of them, or pretty much none of them, have been developed for these specific problems. The question is how to figure out what is the method that is going to work the best. The other problem is how to deal with the poor data regime. Now, unlike a lot of other applications, we usually do not have a lot of high fidelity data. Uh, uh, data from very high fidelity models. Uh, for example, here I'm saying that you have to uh, train your neural network on data from DNS or LES. Now, DNS and LES themselves are very expensive. So are there some of these methods that would work better when you do not have a lot of data? The other, the other uh, challenge is, well, we already know a lot about the physics and the underlying properties of these partial differential equations. So can we somehow use this to improve the performance of our neural networks? The whole area of physics-informed deep learning, uh, basically, uh, is this. The other very important question is generalization or extrapolation. So let's say... I build a neural network using data for a given system, a system that is actually, I can easily uh, simulate. Is there a way that I can use this for a much more complicated system? So can the neural network extrapolate? And the neural networks are known not to extrapolate well. But for us, for our purposes, for these kind of approaches to be useful, they really need to be able to generalize at least a little bit. The other challenge that again, might be more specific to this field, is the offline versus the online performance. You're, I can take a neural network, I can train it to do this representation of y as a function of x, and it might work very well. But when I go and couple it to a conventional CFD solver, the whole thing crashes. And again, we do not have a very good understanding of how to understand the uh, accuracy of neural networks and their stability. It's basically how the error might propagate through these deep neural networks. And so that's a challenge that some people have started to, to worrying about because they come up with a very good neural network, they couple it, and then it doesn't work. So in my group, we have been looking at some s problems that are simpler than the Rayleigh-Bernard that I showed you. So we are trying to look at some systems that have those essential challenging parts of a uh, turbulent flow, but they're not as complicated as something like Rayleigh Bernard. So as I mentioned, we are dealing with systems that are multi-scale, chaotic, uh, and high-dimensional dynamical systems. So what we have done so far is to focus on some equations that have these kind of properties, and then try to look at some of these questions and see what we can do in dealing with them. So the results that I'm going to show you are basically using a prototype chaotic system. So this is called the multi-scale Lorenz 96 system. So 
probably most of you know about the Lorenz system and the butterfly effect and kiosk. So Lorenz in 63, he came up with a very simple set of ODEs that showed those properties. Later in 96, he came up with a more complicated one. And more recently, people have basically built a system that looks like this. So here, this is a set of ODEs that is multi-scale. So here, x is a variable that has eight elements. So it's a vector of size eight. And I have an ODE for this that is coupled to another variable called y. So for each value of x, I have eight values of y. So I have 64 equations for y. And then for each value of y, I have eight values for z. So I have 512 equations for z. And then there is this forcing term f here that if I increase f, I will make the system chaotic. To give you a sense of what comes out of this model, so here at the top, I'm showing you the spatiotemporal evolution of x. So this is x, the eight element. The y-axis is, the x-axis is time that I, call, I show it using model time unit or MTU, and it's around 200 time step. Now if I just take one of the time series here, I'm showing you that, uh, that x here. So you see that it has high amplitude and it sort of has low frequency in time. If I look at one of the time series of y, I'll see that it has a smaller amplitude, but then it has high frequency and intermittency. And if I look at z, I'll see that it's very small and it has high frequency. So this is a multi-scale system, multi-scale chaotic system. It's a pretty good test bed for a lot of these ideas from machine learning uh, to test. So of course, one way to solve these, pro solve these equations is just to integrate everything, pretty much like that DNS approach. Now, to do this, we have to know all the equations. We have to use high resolution, and this can be computationally demanding. Of course, this problem itself is not computationally demanding. You can easily solve it on your laptop. But in the hierarchy of the models I'm going to build, this is the expensive one. Now, the first thing we did in this area was to go to the other end of the spectrum of the models and see whether with machine learning we can just do a fully data-driven prediction of this system. So we're usually interested in x. We are usually interested in larger scales. So let's see if we can come up with a data-driven model that can just predict the evolution of x in a completely data-driven fashion. So I'll just take a history of x, train my neural network, and then see whether I can predict the rest. So in this approach, I'm not going to know anything about the equations. I'm not going to know anything about the smaller scales. And this is going to be computationally very cheap. And what I'm going to show you in the next few slides are from a paper that are currently under review. And this is work in collaboration with Devika Subramanian, who is a computer scientist at Rice. Now, to look at that question of, well, there are a lot of machine learning methods out there. Which one is the best one? for this task. So we kind of look at literature and see what other people have done. So some people have tried to do this using a feed-forward deep artificial neural network. Some other people have thought that, well, let's use what's called LSTM, which is perhaps the most advanced method in this area for spatiotemporal prediction. And then some other peer papers have used another method that is mostly forgotten in the deep learning community. It's called the equestate network or reservoir computing. And of course, this reservoir is different from the reservoir that many of you might be thinking about. So there have been papers uh, kind of applying these for similar problems. They have never been compared side by side because this is a very new field. These papers, you notice, are pretty recent. So we thought, that, OK, can we compare these side by side for this purpose? Also, I have to mention that these methods are very different. So this is a feed-forward network where the basically information goes only in one direction in the neural network. These are recurrent neural networks, or RNNs, so the information can go back and forth. These two are very complicated methods in terms of training. You need to use, you need to use back propagation to train them. There are a lot of parameters to train. This one is extremely simple. Now, for the sake of time, I removed the slides that I was going through the details of this, but I'll be happy to talk to you about these methods. Again, there are, these are methods that are different in terms of the architecture, they're different in terms of the complexity. This is the most complicated one, and in a lot of applications in other domains, 
this is the best method. This is really the simplest one in terms of the complexity of training. So here are some examples of the kind of prediction you can do. So for all of these methods, we have trained them with data before time zero. So anything from time zero and after that, the, uh, the neural network has never seen them. So here, the black line, this is from DNS. So we treat that as the truth. So this is from an initial condition. We have integrated everything. The red is from, uh, from the equestate network. So you'll see that it basically take, gets the evolution of the system pretty well up to more than 2 MTU, which is over 400 time step. So for 400 time step, just fully data-driven prediction, this method can handle that. And this is more than nine the upon of time scale. This is what you get from an ANN, so it can do prediction only up to here. And if you look at LSDM, it can do prediction up to here. So that was over only one initial condition, and I showed you results from one point. But if we basically define a relative L2 norm and average it over 100 random initial conditions, this is the error versus time. So we'll see that this is the error of LSDM. So if you, if you define 30% error as the kind of error that you can tolerate, this method can do prediction for over one MTU on average. It's much better than LSTM, which is here, and it's much better than ANN. As I told you before, one important question in this field is, well, you might have different methods. Which one works the best when you do not have a lot of data? So we have done a scaling analysis where here n is the number of samples that we have for training. The results I showed you were with 500,000 samples. And this is basically the prediction horizon, how far the method can predict before getting to 30% error versus n. We'll see that ANN is kind of saturating, so it really can't get any better even if you put more data into it. We'll see that LSTM is here, and we'll see that ESN is here. The important point is if you look at the poor data regime. When you only have 10,000 samples, there is a clear advantage in one method that was the simplest method out there. So currently, we are working with Devika and trying to understand whether there is a theory that we can develop on why this method for this kind of chaotic dynamical system works better than what's considered that the state of the art in many communities. And, uh, whether we can show why, when you do not have a lot of data, this method works the best. And I'm showing you results only from one chaotic system. We have looked at several different chaotic systems, and we always see this behavior that when you do not have a lot of data, this ESN stands out. Now, we have one method that is pretty good if you just want to do data-driven prediction. But is that really the way we want to use this? So, we really want to go back to the idea of subgrid scale modeling and find ways to still use our CFD model as much as possible, but use some of these advantages, some of these advances in deep learning to accelerate the CFD model. So I'm going to show you some simple cartoons describing several different ways that even in this simple model, we can do simulation of this system. So the DNS is the one I showed you before, basically solve all the equations as accurately as possible. This is a very expensive method. Here we have normalized the cost of all methods so that this has the cost of 1,000. A cheaper method, cheaper model is when you ignore the smallest scales or represent it using a very simple stochastic parameterization, and you can build something that is much cheaper, and we call this a high-resolution model. We can also build a, build a low-resolution model when we are not even going to solve for y and we are going to represent it using a physics-based parameterization. This is super cheap. Its cost is just two. And this is pretty much what you can think of as all the models that we can afford, whether you are doing weather climate prediction or whether you are doing CFD for any problem in the industry. If you are running Fluent or ANSYS or something, this is pretty much what we can afford when we, are, we have a highly parameterized model that has physics-based parameterization. Something that most in the experimental uh, stage is, what, is the idea that's called super parameterization. When people still solve the equation only for x, but coupled with this, a solver for y. So you still solve the equations for x, 
and the equations for y. You sort of simplify this, so you can build something that is cheaper. It's still more expensive than this, but it's cheaper than DNS. And the hope is that this works better compared to this one. I'm not going to go through all the details, but you can think of this as a, like a, basically a multi-scale numerical solver. Now, looking at what people have been trying to do with machine learning is this idea of data-driven parameterization, which as I mentioned before, we are going to replace that physics-based parameterization with a neural network. And in this case, we replace it with a, just an ANN. And again, this has very low computational cost. So the model that we have developed in my group, which kind of building on the results that I showed you first. Now we have methods, RNNs, that can integrate an equation in time for 200, 300 time steps. So what we have proposed is to go to these super parameterized models that some people have developed and are very interested in, that are expensive, and instead of using a numerical solver for the equations for smaller scales, let's just use an RNN to integrate those in time. So once you do that, the cost of this method will be the same as the cost of these methods. And we call this data-driven superparameterization. So now to show you the results, so this is the uh, prediction horizon, averaged over 100 random initial condition. If you use a high resolution model, very expensive, you get the best results. The super parameterized model is cheaper, its performance is pretty good, and the most conventional methods, very cheap, but it has low accuracy. If you use a data-driven parameterization method using machine learning, you see that you can get much better results compared to a conventional method. Same cost, much better accuracy. But if you use this data-driven superparameterization method that we have proposed, that is, you still integrate some equations for the smallest scales in time, we'll see that it works even better than this data-driven parameterization. So it's much cheaper than superparameterized model by a factor of 20, and its accuracy becomes comparable. And this is a fully data-driven model. Now the results that I've discussed so far are all with a system that you have very well-defined a scale separation between X and Y. But as I mentioned, for a turbulent flow, we do not have much scale separation. So we can go through the system and tweak the parameters to really remove this scale separation that I showed you before. When you have low frequency, high frequency, high frequency, and make the system so that everything has similar low frequency. So X and Y and Z are very highly coupled. If we do that, I don't know what happened to one of the slides, but uh, if you do that, then you will see that the data-driven superparameterization method would work much better. Now, finally, Everything I have done so far, I have trained on with, with the same forcing on the system and tested with the same forcing. But to test that question about generalization, we can think of, well, maybe I can afford to do simulation with the lower forcing. I train everything there and I test it when the system is more chaotic, when the forcing of the system is higher. So there's a lot of stuff on this slide, so I'm just going to briefly mention them. So, the blue is what we had before, when F is 20. The diamonds, this is when we increase the forcing on the system. So the system is more chaotic, it's harder to predict it. Now, if we use the, predict the training that we had for that forcing 20 of 20, and use it when the system is more chaotic, we'll see that, for example, a fully data-driven model has a lot of drop in accuracy. So it doesn't generalize. These two methods, the ones that you use machine learning with some numerical solver, they have much better generalization capabilities. Now, if you go to the problem when you do not have much scale separation, when everything is very strongly coupled, we'll see that even the data-driven superparameterization method has what's called a generalization gap. So, if you train it on F equals 20 and test it on a more chaotic system, you have lost 
your accuracy. And to basically address this problem, which is the main concern that many people have about using deep learning, and you got the time? Okay. Is to use transfer learning, which is something that is used, has been used in many other domains to, to basically solve this generalization or extrapolation problem. But as far as I know, this is the first time that it has been used to actually solve, address the question of generalization in this kind of subgrid scale modeling problem. So the idea of transfer learning is we trained the, we, so far we have trained everything with a lot of samples. I'm almost done. Um, and if you use this, for a, when you have a more chaotic system, it's not going to work. But let's say we have some simulation of the new system that instead of one million samples, I only ten, take 10K samples. So 1% of that original data. And I retrain my neural network, initialize with the weights from this training, and use this to test it on F24. And here we'll see that the results, instead of being here, there are these stars. Or especially for the data-driven model, we are kind of closing this generalization gap. So this major concern that many people have with using machine learning for these kind of applications there are strategies that we can use. Now, everything I showed so far are with a very simple chaotic system. The next step for us is to apply this to more complicated PDEs, and eventually, we hope that in a few months we can apply this to that Ray Bernard system. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. I think we have time for a couple of questions. So we have one here in front here, and then we have one in the back afterwards over there. Uh, Bob Akshofei from Aqua Energy. Uh, I was wondering when you uh, combine data-driven with uh, uh, classic PDEs, how do you treat type of boundary conditions? Uh, so that's a good question. So here our problem is simple. So we don't have boundary conditions on Y to, to deal with. The equation I showed you is just an ODE. So we're just integrating in time. But we are not we have started working with the Berger's equation, uh, and just having boundary conditions starts to give us a lot of problems. So that's something to, uh, to think about and figure out whether in the loss function of the neural network, we have to sort of enforce the kind of boundary conditions that we want. The other thing is we are working on, for example, if, your, if you know that kinetic energy in your system is conserved, can you force that in your, um, in your loss function? But yeah, that's a good question. So we are actually dealing with that right now. In the back there. Aman Verma from Microsoft, uh, great talk. So I'd like to highlight a couple of areas of application of such ML-based models for CFD or scientific computing in general. One is in the uh, post-processing or analysis of simulated data, which can be four-dimensional in space and time. And the other is in the, uh, in the higher level optimization framework, mm -hmm. which is underneath using some sort of scientific code. Uh, where the optimizer itself could be a neural network-based method. So any comments on those? Yeah, the, I, I, yeah, I think those are great ideas. And, and I think there can be a lot of applications uh, for these kind of approaches that, again, you're not going to just to do a fully data-driven, which is like after like the first set of results that I show you, some people think, well, let's just get rid of all the equations and all the numerical solvers, and we can do everything in a data-driven fashion. And here we are showing that actually, the more that you, you keep what we know and we have worked on for, for decades in terms of numerical solvers, uh, there are advantages in that. But in, in, in those like, uh, problems that I listed at the beginning, I think there are a lot of applications that can be for these kind of approaches, where your CFD solver is just going to be faster, and we, we are trying to make it as accurate as it was before. But I'll be happy to chat more about uh, potential applications. Any additional questions? If not, thank me in joining uh, Pedram again. Oh, there was one more. Oh, hold on, hold on. Was there one over here? Was there a question over here somewhere? OK. Hi. Um, just curious on uh, normalized costs there. Is that kind of the assumption that all of those were the same system? Uh, so they're all the same systems. And we have done our best, but the cost I'm presenting in terms of counting the number of equations that we are solving numerically. 
So one thing I didn't mention is we are assuming that all the neural networks have zero cost, which is, of course, you know, there's a lot uh, to think about there. And we don't want to, for now, think about, because, you know, we are fully dynamicists. We are not the best, you know, programmers and, you know, software hardware people. But the next step is to actually work with computer scientists and people who have those expertise to do actual measurement of how much saving we are getting because just transferring data between these different uh, systems, that would certainly have some overhead on the cost. Okay, now let's join in me in thanking our speaker. Thank <laughs>